Welcome to The Great Debate, Volume 1, which is episode number 55 of the Carp Chronicles podcast. Now, as this is Volume 1, it kind of alludes to the fact that there's going to be more, and there is. I would like to do numerous podcasts in the Great Debate range, which basically comprise of me sitting down with a couple of bait experts, and we will really dive in deep to all manner of different things regarding bait. Obviously, it's a huge topic. I know we cover it a lot in a lot of these episodes that we do, but I wanted to sit down with a couple of experts and just really kind of dive in deep and see what comes out. I mean, ultimately, as anglers, we all want to put more fish on the bank. Sometimes that means changing our bait. So anyone that wants to catch more fish and is open to changing their bait, I think there's something for everyone in these episodes. But also bear in mind, it's quite heavily scientific. It might not be for everyone. Now, this particular great debate, which is obviously volume one, our very first one, it was recorded well over three hours. I think it was about three and a half hours. So what I've done is I've split that in two and put it into a part one and part two. Obviously, this is part one. You can expect part two probably in around about a week or so. Now, before we jump into the episode, of course, I need to mention this podcast is made possible by my own bait company optibaits.com which comprises of different products which I feel are sorely missing from the market I honestly I don't want to sound too dramatic but I put my blood sweat tears heart and soul into these products I really really do and a lot of the ideas and the things come from speaking to a lot of experts in the field I mean I'm in a very unique position with this podcast I've spoken to a lot of the the leading bait heads in the UK and I'm lucky enough to call most of them my friends so uh, yeah very unique very unique situation for myself and I've been making bait on my own for you know over 20 years now so I'd like to think I have something very unique to offer the marketplace so if you haven't done so already check out optibaits.com that's it I will stop waffling on I hope you enjoyed the very first episode of the great debate I guess neither of you are joining me with a tip of the episode are we are you Absolutely not. No. I've got I've got some what what we call in Bolton Corporation pop. Yeah, a bit of water. Yeah, tap water. Get it down, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm having Coke Zero. Coke Zero. Just opened it. Get you, you reformed character. Seven weeks without a beer today for me. Good man. Mm. Your your liver will thank you, even if your sanity doesn't. Yeah, definitely. No, I'm not. I'm not too bad now. I've uh, I've got over the worst of it. <laughs> the shakes are dry heat. No, I've never, I've never, <laughs> I've never had the shakes, mate. I'd have packed in a long time ago if that happened. <laughs> Fair play. What, what are you on, Sam? Stella? Yeah. I'm. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple. Yeah, you read my mind. Yeah, I got a couple of Stellas. Um, I got a bit of gin if I run out of that. It's terrible, isn't it? Not very supportive of you boys, but um, uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I will. I will have I, a few bits. I ain't got no problem with anybody drinking, mate. No, do you know what? I'm, I've cut back a lot, and I'm going to cut back more, and I'm going to have less beer and more spirits when I do drink. Um, <laughs> which is it's a step. Less calories, it? Is it less calories if you have spirits? You got less calories, yeah. But beer is estrogenic, which obviously for blokes is is really not a good thing. It's not a good thing for women either. If it, you know, depending on where mm. they sit on the on the spectrum, but yeah, it's estrogenic. There's more calories, obviously uh, carbohydrates as well. So you got your your blood sugar spike. There's a few things that sort of work against you. It's quite inflammatory as well because of the grains. Mm. Um, whereas something you know like um like pure vodka. It's much better for you. A bit of sparkling water, squeeze some lime in it. It's a lot health. It's not healthy, but it's a lot healthier for sure. The healthiest drinking option. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Right, boys. I, as I've just said to you, off mic or off air, so to speak, uh, I have nothing prepared. We've decided to do this episode. Um, I'm sure once we get started, we're going to go all go off on many different tangents. Um, but I think we've all said at various times. Actually, it was Dean's idea. Um, I know we said that, that it would be a good to get us all on the show. I know you had some things that you wanted to cover, Dean. I've got nothing in mind. I don't think Whitey's got anything in mind, either of you, Steve. Uh, nothing specific, no. No. So over to you, Dean. <laughs> well, I mean, the the only thing was, is, um, I remember when you and Steve did, um, I think it might have been his last podcast, because you had two in the, in the row, didn't you? 
with Steve? Uh, it was part well, you did one, a two-parter, two. didn't you? Two-parter. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was just a few uh, things on there um, that just sort of stimulated me. Some of the stuff that you were talking about, melt proteins and stuff, um, green lip muscle, that was another one. And then there was there was loads of other different things that I was thinking about with regard to opioids that I hadn't covered before. Uh, so there's there's loads of things that that I've got in my mind that I could sort of chat about between yeah. themselves. Um, so yeah, that was about it really. I mean, it's like it's like green muscle. I know you're a big advocate of it, uh, and I have used it um, more so. Well, in the '90s, really, when I used it, but I never really. I never really found that I thought it was something that was good for bigger fish, where I know you rate it highly for older and bigger fish, but I never really did notice a- a- any correlation with that. Uh, it caught well. The bait with it in caught well. And I mean, and this was years ago, like using the Nutribate stuff at low levels. Mm. And it definitely did make a difference. Um, But, the following year, after I'd used that in 1996, and I did catch well, uh, I completely changed and made my own bait from scratch. And there was no green lip muscle in it, but I was using the bait without seaweed in um, in 96. And then the following year, made a bait with seaweed in. And then it all sort of ties in with what you find out later on. Because what a lot of people won't know is that the actual... Lots of the molecules that are in green lip mussel powder, they're attractive to carp. You can find them in seaweed as well. And a lot of people won't know that, but you can. Well, you do find them in seaweed. Um, I don't know. What, what's your thoughts on green lip mussel, Sam? Why, why do you think? I mean, obviously, you go by results as well. But w- what leads you to think that it is slightly selective for bigger, older fish? Can I just interrupt? What levels? When you said you used it at low levels, what levels were you using it at? I think I think it's ridiculously low, Steve. But believe you me, I think it was something like three grams per six egg mix. Now, obviously, depending on the size of the eggs, yeah, at the most that's only going to be. It's similar to the sort of levels that you're going to use betaine at. Um, but you can actually. I don't know if. See, you didn't start... Were you caught fishing there, Steve, in the 90s? Um, I didn't catch my first carp in 96. Yeah, so that's the year that I used it. Um, and and you, you could smell it in the finished bait because it was... It, the Nutribate's green lip muscle extract in, in the 90s, it was very oily and it had a, a strong smell and it was, it, was a lot, it was a bit darker than all the stuff I've seen now. Uh, and you could fat. actually... Sorry? It was full fat. Yeah, it was full fat, yeah. And you, you could actually you could actually smell it in the finished bait, like because me, me and my mate used the same bait that year, different attractor packs, uh, but I used the green lip muscle and he didn't, and and you could smell the difference in the bait. And to be truthful with you, I did catch better than him. I mean, he had he had a fantastic year the year before, and he he stayed on this exactly the same recipe. Um, we we're both using Premier Spice Fish, uh, but the only thing I was doing different was the green lip muscle and and and. Yeah, it, it seemed to edge it. And like I say, you could detect it in the finished bait. You know, a human nose could smell the difference, even at that really low level. I mean, it's minuscule. It's absolutely minuscule level, but you, you find different things out later on, you know, about the betaine content, uh, the DMPT, and and, you, and then you find different things out about other ingredients like seaweed. Um, and you just think to yourself, well, I can get the same molecules in there with seaweed, probably at higher levels as well, because it costs a lot less money, so you can put more in. Yeah, you see, when I, when I have used green lip mussel, I've used it at about 8%. Which is high, yeah. I mean, is that full but, fat but, as well? That's full fat, but also it has 5% kelp in it as well. Yeah, yeah. As well as as well as well other goodies. Um, one thing I, I would say is with DMPT, I never noticed a difference with DMPT. Yeah, if you're using the pure form of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The stuff from yeah. feeds them. I, yeah. I, I put it put it in and took it out and did not notice any difference. Well, I mean, I've tested it as well, not not extensively, um, and I can't say 
I could make my mind up either way, really. Um, I've got friends who have used it in Hookbaits, and they've had some exceptional sessions when they've used it, but even then, they, they still can't make their mind up. But the way I look at it is uh, that it's, it's in seaweed, it's in greenlit mussel, but there's other things in there. So you're getting a bit of synergy, and it's, at, it's, at, it's probably at even lower levels than what you're adding if you're adding it in the pure form. Um, so you don't know what's going on with the car from the attraction point of view when it's working in tandem with different things, you know. What I would like to know, and I don't know the answer to this, is I'd like to know how much DMPT is in, let's say, 100 grams of seaweed versus, say, 10 grams of full-fat GLM. Do you, I don't, do you know how they compare or, or not? I don't really know how, you, how, the, how it would quantify but yeah. what I will say as well is um, you've also got dimethyl sulfide, DMS, in both of them and because that's a degradation product of the DMPT. And, and, and in all the scientific studies, dimethyl sulfide is also extremely attractive to carp. Um, so there's lots of things going on there that will attract the fish. Now, w- when I've done other research on green nut mussel and stuff, um, I've never noticed that the amino acid profile of it um, fits what, in my mind, most things that I think are selective for big carp are iron, which is um, branch chain amino acids, like milk proteins, if yeah. you like, and other things. Um, but I, I also did wonder if um, if you looked at it from the angle of um, the anti-inflammatory properties of the full-fat green lip muscle, yeah. With the older fish sort of thing, um, because you know that that's exploited in the human health market and all the rest of it, and you never know if that's something that could have a, have an effect. You know, you just you don't know. Yeah, definitely, and uh, yeah, I agree with what you're saying about the anti-inflammatory things, and I think I've spoke about this on the podcast before. Um, I was looking into to that side of nutrition for carp. The thing is, I think, and again, it's hard to know how it translates across to carp because what is, you know, somewhat anti-inflammatory to humans or or even dogs, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate to carp, as you both know. No. So that's very difficult. But there are a lot of different things, some of them which we commonly use in baits that are a lot more anti-inflammatory than GLM anyway. So I don't know if it... I don't think the key to its success, if it is, you know, if you do believe it's successful, which I do, I don't think you could really chalk it up to the anti-inflammatories. But again, who knows? It might be more transferable to carp. Obviously, they're an aquatic creature, just like the the, the green lip mussels are. So I don't know. It's very interesting. Just quickly, whilst I've got the mic, to go back and answer your question. Um, I mean, I started using GLM because I had, to be totally honest, I'd heard it was good for big fish uh, and obviously heard people raving about it. This is going back fucking years. When I started using it, I kept my, I remember this vividly. I kept my mix exactly the same, started using it. In fact, I started using it in hook baits and then quickly used it in my feed baits. And I just noticed a, a, a big change. And I do mean a big change in my catch results. You could, can you say it's 100% down to the GLM? You can never say that, but it was just too much of a coincidence for it to not be true. Again, I was using it really high levels. I can't remember how much, but I I know it would have been very high. And certainly these days, you know, I'd like it at 10% of full fat, which is fucking expensive. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I think you have to use it in high quantities to see a result. Though I think these people that are using it at say three or four, five percent, even I just I think you need to go higher than that for it to be worthwhile. If I had to use it at five percent, I just wouldn't bother using it. Full stop. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've used it uh, in hoop baits at high levels, um, and it's been quite a good test, really, because. I've stuck it into the super orange um, hook baits a few times, um, and that and that's an extremely good catcher that bait is. And I've never really noticed any any standout differences in the results with the green let mussel in there. Um, it's only in hook baits though, but you know, so mm. yeah. D- well, that, that- can, can- Sorry, what um, what was the base mix, Sam? What you were using the GLM in? 
back in the day, it would have been yeah. a somewhat basic fish meal at that time. It was, I can actually remember the mix because it was something I used for quite a lot. It was 30% uh, LT94, um, I think 8% uh, CPSP90. There was CLO in there. Um, Super Gold 60, uh, 60, a prairie meal. Um, so, so a basic, a basic a whole, ba rolled, a whole, a whole rolled fish meal. Exactly, yeah. Basic yeah. fish meal. This is probably about 15 years ago. Again, I noticed a big, um, a big change in results. Even if I wasn't convinced up to then, and this is not a plug or anything like that, but since I started using the GLM in that primer powder and the hydro blend, more so the primer powder, that has just that's changed my mind beyond i don't doubt it i have zero doubt in it i'm super confident in it now i wonder if that's because it's not boiled i don't know whether that would have some kind of effect yeah definitely. Um, but the powder is just being used on top of the primer powder is typically people would either use it in a bag or they would just chuck it on top of their boilies with some liquid so it clings to the outside whether that's what's doing it but but that glm primer powder is is serious stuff and and you know that that's just sort of cemented it for me um see see uh, another thing as well i mean i haven't done enough research into it to know the answers i mean you might know a bit more about it sam but i never forget um there was one water in stoke and there was lads going on there it's a day ticket water and they're using the my super orange bait and the bait that they actually sold at the day ticket water and what was going in there a bit, not loads of it, but probably more than more super more than there was super orange going in there was um well I won't name the company, but the bait with ten percent so called green lip muscle in there, but it's defatted. I know the one you mean. Now now the super orange absolutely annihilated that lake. There was eight thirties in there, and they caught five of them in one day. Uh and this Green lip mussel, ten percent base that was going in there, and they were selling. I think it only caught one thirty out of there, and that was it. Um, so it's just different things like that. But as I say, that's the the defatted uh, green lip mussel. Now I don't know what the actual defatting process does to it with regard. As far as I can see, it won't take out the betaine. I might be wrong. It shouldn't take out the DMPT. It shouldn't take out the DMS. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not 100% because it's not an area. It's not something that I use anymore. I mean, I do use a shellfish extract now, but it's not green lip mussel. Um, and yeah, uh, so I don't know. I mean, maybe you know, got a, an opinion on that, Sam, because you know a lot more about green lip mussel than I do and you, and you advocate it more than I do. Yeah, I, d I don't know if I necessarily do know more about it than you, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure exactly, as I understand it, obviously, it's going to be somewhat denatured. I mean, you're taking the fat out for a start. The fat soluble vitamins in it are going to be removed. Now, of course, like, the, yeah, the, what about, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The, the vitamins aren't necessarily what we're after. That's not why we're using it. But I mean, who knows again, and this is ambiguous or I'm going by results. How do we know exactly what is working in the GLM? We don't really, there might be some unquantifiable thing or something that even me or you just don't know is in there. Maybe that is dispersed within the fat. I mean, a lot of, well, vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat soluble. As yeah. well as that, there's different compounds in animals and plants which are also fat soluble. So yeah. maybe something in it which is making it, you know, very effective is fat soluble. And therefore, during the process where they take the fat out, obviously it's not, it's not there, is it? Because it's in the fat. That yeah. might be part of it. As well as that, obviously, manufacturing process to, to extract that fat. As I understand it, the defatted stuff, it's almost um, like a, a byproduct. They remove the fat for because that that's the desirable part or proponent of, of the... Of that's the, for the health their, food industry, isn't it? Exactly. So yeah. they're wanting the fatty part of the GLM, mm -hmm. presumably. It must be because that is where, obviously, the nutrients reside. So whilst I haven't seen a breakdown sheet of, uh, of knowing exactly how they do it or what is it removed, it just stands to reason that... To put it bluntly, the the good stuff is removed from that process. That yeah, it's the, the they're just ex, they're extracting that um, glucosamine stuff, aren't they, for anti-inflammatories for arthritis, chondritis, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As, far, as far as I understand it, it's cold pressed to get the oil out. 
Yeah, same as so, Amp, yeah. Yeah, you, but the, the difference is when, when, when you press a fish meal, you get what's called the stick water. Which, yeah, which, which is, all, the, which is the best also, bit. Yeah, you have the liquid bits. <laughs> now, now, in LT, in LT um, fish meals, they add the stick water back in. That's after after, after they've skimmed the oil, they add the stick water back in. Yeah. Now, with GLM... I don't know if I, I don't know what the process is. Whether they add whether they add that back in, or do they then try and further purify it for whatever they're trying to get out of it? But my point is, if you, if you take the liquids and the oil out of the GLM, all the, all the water soluble things you're talking about as well may be lost. I, I don't know what the process is. Yeah, like you say, I'm with you all the way there, Steve, because that's what sets all the LT fish meals over and above all the other fish meals, the stick water being fed back in, because that's the most important Absolutely. part. So it's got soluble. all the soluble soluble stuff in. It's got the amino acids in, a lot of the nucleotides. It makes it far more far more attractive than anything that hasn't had it fed, fed back in. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know whether, whether that happens with you. Yeah, you could be right there. There might there might be something like that going on where where there's a a massive loss degradation in in the amount of the molecules in there that are attracting the fish. Yeah, I I definitely I definitely definitely believe that the full fat is head and shoulders above the defatted. Steve, you've obviously used it a bit. What what are your findings on it? Um, well, when I used it on Selby um, in in a fish meal. But the fish meal was very good. Um, the only reason I stopped using it is when I went to Nipton and it was it was full of big bream, big dusting lids. So I thought I'm not paying for full fat GLM to feed bream. Um, I did I did well for the mirrors on Selby, but looking back now because I know a lot more, it's hard to pass out whether everything about that bait was good. It, it was a you know thirty percent LT ninety four. It had sort of ten percent CSP, uh, CPSP ninety. It had the original L zero thirteen. It had some good flavours in, and then it had sort of eight percent full fat GLM. So back then, I was convinced that GLM was the future. Um, now I'm, I'm just not sure. Certainly, with the price of full fat GLM now, it's if you put it in boilers at eight percent, it's a dear do it, it probably costs more than the rest of the base mix put together, doesn't it? Yeah. Who would you get yours off, Sam? Or are you know, willing to disclose that one? Um <laughs> I'd rather not because I don't want it to I don't want it to dry up. Yeah, yeah. There's but, not many there's not many people that sell it now, is there? Oh mate, it is it's imported, I'll tell you that much, and it's it's not from uh, feed stim, although feed stim do do a good one. Yeah. Um yeah, it's fucking expensive. It's eighty odd quid, something like that, a kilo. Yeah, Fun. yeah hideously expensive but um yeah. i mean just to touch on it as well there's different i mean not all full fat glms are equal they're really not um and a lot of what is sold in the uk is i don't know whether it's cut with something else or whether it's just an inferior product um but yeah it, it's it's hard to get really high quality full fat glm and unless you're getting that stuff i just don't think it's worth it i really don't yeah well I, i've seen the i bought some of the defatty stuff and when i got when i got it i just thought this is nothing like the glm that i used to i mean even that glm that used to go off nutribates in the 90s it's nothing like that whatsoever it doesn't even smell the same it doesn't even look the same it's not even the same color or anything yeah yeah but yeah i mean I, at the end of 1996 like i thought glm was the future like me and my mate used to laugh about it when i used to catch it, I used to go, yeah, it's the glm but then the following year i made another bait I mean, it was a good fish wheel bait. Very simple recipe, but loads of milks in there, refined milks, a uh, good level of seaweed. And, and that bait caught as well, if not better than that other bait with GLM. But like I say, it was very low levels. I mean, you two probably think that that was doing nothing. But I don't know. I, th I think it was contributing something to the bait because you could actually smell it in the finished bait. Mm. Yeah, I, I maybe as well, it's, it's the... Um... The synergy between and again i'm just this is not scientific this is just an idea maybe it's the synergy between different ingredients for example maybe if you got a good amount of cpsp90 you got a good amount of full fat glm maybe there's something there maybe it's a different ingredient i'm not suggesting it is cpsp90 or, or a pre-digested 
it's just using it as an example but um maybe there's something there you just said you used it in was it a non-fish meal what me yeah no no it was um i'll tell you the i'll tell you the recipe um very very simple bait because the bait i was using in 96 was the spice fish mix premiers and that was extremely simple bait it was just fish meal um 25 percent milks which was lactalbumin and casein um and then it was 25 percent cielo bird food that was the fish mix but then obviously the spiced fish had got a bit of robin redden and maybe other spices i don't know um so it was a very very simple recipe so all i did is emulated that but i thought well um i'll put seaweed in mine as well and i, I used pravimi i mean and back then like pravimi was flame dried fish meal but loads of people had used it and told me it was good uh so it was just pravimi um 10 percent rennet casein 10 percent lactalbumin five percent robin red five percent seaweed and a bit of soya flour and it, it was a blinding base i mean i used a couple of liquids but no liquid foods um two liquid attractors, if you like. Mm. And that was it. Extremely simple bait, but that bait caught absolutely brilliantly for me. Um, you know, a bit of pre-baiting going on as well, but it, it, they were shitting it out and it caught really well. And yeah, so it's difficult to say. I probably didn't fish as much in 97 as I did in 96, but I fished enough to get a, a, a gauge on it. And well, on the opening night of the season in 1997, I had seven fish and I think there was only one other fish out the entire lake and there was about eight people on so it was doing the job yeah it's interesting isn't it? i mean again like i'm sure we'll all agree there's so many different variables it is almost impossible to pin it down it really is um but uh yeah i'm i'm using a fish meal now it doesn't have any glm in it to be honest with you um because a, it's fucking expensive b that i've gone a different i've gone more down the liver route with that bait um so it's, yeah, thought, it's not that I wouldn't, it's not that I think it's the best thing in the world, but I do really rate it highly. And to be honest, I do use it because I use the GLM primer powder on the top yeah, of it. But yeah. I'll tell you what I looked into um, with GLM because I'm big on this branch chain amino acid thing. I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that I'm onto something with it mm. for bigger fish and older fish. And, and I looked at the amino acid profile of GLM and, it, and it's not particularly high in, in the branch chain amino acids, which is. Uh, yeah isoleucine leucine and valine but when i looked at liver powder liver powder is slightly different liver powder sort of does tick the boxes to to being towards what i would consider a good amino acid profile for attracting larger older fish i thought that was quite interesting yeah i mean even the vitamins in liver powder i mean they're the b vitamins in particular which i think are quite important in carp for carp um, totally Choline, choline as yeah. well. Choline yeah. and nucleotides. It's very similar to me, like liver powders. It's very similar to yeast. It's very similar in, in, in the respects of how it attracts the fish. It's, it's very similar to yeast. Mm. I think liver, liver and yeast go well together. I've never used them in combination. Have you not? No. You see, you see my, my, my bait would always, if I was using a fish meal these days, I would always tend to put brococel and um and chicken liver eye drawing as well yeah i mean you get and, people and ker- and, sorry and ker- but, but before they stopped messing about with kerimine i used to put that in at three percent as well and that, that yeah. seemed to do really well well that was in the old activate bait wasn't it and that was a good bait i don't know yeah that, that's what it was in activate kerimine yeah all right yeah yeah well i've learned something new today yeah yeah it was uh they reckon that was like the key to that bait success. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I know. I know a bit about that bait. I know a bit about some of the old mainline baits. I don't know an awful lot about the new baits, um, but know about the old ones. I don't think there's a lot to know about the new baits. Well, yeah, the less said, the better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not slagging it off. I, I just think they've, they've got. Um, no, they're very simple. So, some of the new yeah, baits they've, now. They've also but... got the same base mix as well. I think. Yeah, very, very simple. Um, obviously digestible and attractive and that but yeah the actual base bases are pretty simple i think especially for the sal and stuff you know the 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 other one what's the other one called hybrid yeah yeah they're all pretty much similar i think dean do you know much about the um about the original grange yeah i know quite a bit about that yeah 
what what do you reckon was working so well there was it a case of just advance for the times or do you think there was something there there was a lot of good things in that bait um there was a cheese powder in it mm. which you know cheese powder is extremely good yeah. additive for baits you know you got the opioid thing and the organic acids um it got may uh, may i think it, it got maize meal in or yeah i think it got maize meal in and anything with maize is attractive because it goes back to this uh, dimethyl sulfide thing because that it's from the it, it comes during the cooking process that, and it's it's extremely attractive to carp anything maize is. Even even your maize flour and stuff, but Steve will know because he he uses a bait with a lot of prairie meal in, uh, super gold, whatever you want to call it. And if you get a good batch of that, you can tell the difference as soon as you get it when you smell it. Yeah, because mm. the good the good stuff really stinks, and and you know that'll be better than the stuff what wasn't smelling as much. It's the dimethyl sulfide. It also maize products seem to ferment really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you, as soon as you put it in the water or, or if it's in your bucket, it's already improving things. Mm. That's, that's the one thing I, I, I've noticed with, uh, with, with, with Super Gold 60 is when you start putting stuff like that in, it really does, um, seem to turn the baits. It's a very <laughs> underrated ingredient, that because it's cheap. People think it's going to be crap, but it, they couldn't be further from the truth. It's quite a good ingredient, Super Gold is. Mm. Well, I, I was surprised how, how well that bait performed. That's the, the, the bait, what I call the Grenville's Golden Balls, is 20% Super Gold 60. Yeah, yeah. And I basically replaced replaced the LT fish meal with Super Gold 60 just for the colour. Um, and and it, 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 it turns really well. It, 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 it's just a, a, a good ingredient. Have, um, you got, have you got no fish meal in that bait, Steve? Um, there's a shitload of CPSP ninety in it. But well, there's, 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 there's no, uh, there's no um, whole intact proteins from yeah. fish meal in it. Yeah, but you're um, still getting that marine boost, aren't you, from this? Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. an out and out uh, attractive bait. As I see it, it's not, it's not um, what I would call a high food value bait, although it has a high food value relative to a lot of commercial baits. That's not yeah. the that's not the the premise is is, is for it to be out and out attractor, um, but it does turn really well. Like I've got some sweaty. Well, I did have till I went to Grenville last time. I've got some really sort of sweaty old old ones. What I use in my bags, and, and they're absolutely white. Or they, they were till I used them up, um, and they were sticky, and, and and it just turns really well without going green mold. You get you get when when you get the lovely white sort of fungal sticky smelly mess on the outside. Mm. It just seems to, to turn really well. And that's put sugar, always... you put sugar in that bait, Steve. Did you put any sugar in it? No, not at all. Not at all. Nothing at all. No liquids with any sugar in or anything. No, absolutely not. There's no the only liquids in that bait are um, hemp oil, um, some shrimp paste. Which is technically not, not a liquid, um, and, and then I don't even put any flavors in. So, so no, there's absolutely no liquids whatsoever. No milk, I mean, no milk powder. Um, no. Mm. No. Uh, well, yes. Uh, well, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's ten, it's 10 percent um, orange gel. Yeah, yeah, but no, no calf milk. No, no, no. Mm. Yeah, well, there's there's a bit there's a bit of sugar in the orange gel, isn't there? There's not loads, but there's a bit. Yeah, there's there's got to be some lactose, but but it's it's very little because our orange gel is eighty percent protein. Yeah, I, th I think there's about I think there's about don't hold me cheap, but I think there's about ten percent. I was going to say I was I was going to stab at a maximum of ten percent. Yeah, I think there's about ten percent in that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there is. I mean, you, you've got sugar in all the whey protein concentrates. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I don't necessarily think... But what I did think about, actually, was, was getting some lactose powder and putting it in... Um, well, I was actually thinking of putting it in my maize. My actual fermented maize was getting some lactose powder. I've not done it yet, but I was just wondering if... if um, 
with the, with the culture I've got in, in me in me in my maze, I was wondering if I put some lactose in on the soak, whether whether you would get a bigger a bigger production of lactic acid. Mm. And it's something I have all these ideas and I don't I don't sort of get on them for years sometimes. Um, but that that was something I was thinking about is getting getting lactose and putting it in and see what happens. Um, but I'm presuming the only way you could change that is check the pH. It's, sorry, to check that is to get a is to take the pH. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that's, that's that's why I'm a fan of of, of skim milk powder. Because it has a very high um, lactose content, yeah, and, and and I think, especially when you use something like skim milk powder in a nut mix, I, th- I think it's it's very good for. I think when you turn it, one of the principal attractors is lactic acid. So yeah, well, it'll be it'll definitely be attractive to carp. Lactic acid, well, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I can tell, I tell from my maze because my maze has definitely got lactic acid in it from from how I do it, mm. um, and it's 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 changed my fishing since since I um, since I started doing that. Well, Terry yeah. Ian's but Terry Ian's big on his special maze, isn't he? He likes a bit of special maze. He salts it though as well, doesn't he? I think. Yeah, it does. I mean, the video I saw a couple of years ago, he was putting treacle on it. I think. Yeah, I think he does. I think he does. But I, mean, I, I used to put molasses. I used to put molasses on my maize back, you know, a few years ago, and, and ferment it with yeast. Um, but the way I do it now is, um, I, w- I would say it's it's definitely better. Um, it really. I, I I need to check the pH on it. To be fair, it's something I've not done. I've just I've just sort of made it and left it, and, it, and it's working. So so I'm sort of happy with it, but. Um, I need to concentrate less on nutrition and get back on back on my bait head. Um, but it's it's um, seems to to really work since since I've been using it in in my mix. When I say mix like a spot mix, then it, it seems to have have made a big difference. Yeah, so, uh, anything maize, they, they they love maize. I tell you, uh, anything that's I think a lot of it's like you say. Uh, I'm 100% convinced that that dimethyl sulfide for maize is a big puller for carp. It's a big mm. puller. Because mm. I know I know one, one lad who, who's basically had a maize bait made up. I can't really say where, where, where he's using it, but he, he's basically had a maize bait made up. And he said, he's told me it's 70% maize, the bait. Yeah. And he, he's having it, he's, he's not rolling it, he's having it rolled up at, He's having a load of eight mil balls made, and and basically he's filling it in with his seventy percent maize balls at eight mil, um, and he seems to catch. Yeah, well, you know? I, I've um, I tell you what I did when I, in the early days when I made that um, that milk bait of mine. I mean, it's not sky iron milk. It's got it's got more than most baits on the market to have in the HXB. Sam's had a bit of it, and. Um, we had really good results on it on a couple of waters. Um, and then when I took it on Trenton, very silty, old estate lake, it, it just wasn't working properly. It, it just seemed like it just seemed like it just wasn't cutting it. It wasn't attracting the fish properly. It wasn't stopping them or anything. So I tinkered around with it. And one of the things that I added to the bait was um, maize protein, super gold. Uh, I mean, I did a few other things as well. But that bait then, it was like a different bait. It just seemed like the food signal cut straight through the silt. And it just showed, and I only put it in at 5%. I put the super gold in at 5%. Um, I added a couple of other things. And it, and, it, and it was a good lesson. It was a, it was a good lesson. And a, a failure was a very good lesson because it made it a better bait. Because I'm always annoyed if, if a bait won't work on, on a particular substrate because I like trying. I mean, it's impossible to optimize it for everywhere, but. I like it so it'll work in all different conditions. And that bait, that those few little tweaks there did, uh, and that maize protein definitely helps it because it really is attractive. Well, in my my golden balls, I've I've swapped the sawyer out and put tiger uh, nut flour in now. Yeah. Um. Just just for extra fermentation. Yeah, that. 
that that starts that starts going if you aren't careful when it's just in a bucket when it's dry. He, it's you can tell it you can tell it's a bit active that um, maize flower because it starts getting a bit of a funny smell on it after you've had it for so long. Yeah, um, I mean it's hard, it's hard to quantify or qualify what that could be because you seem to get whenever I get a, a new batch of it, it always looks different. Mm. Some sometimes it's it's like really gold, like like a dark gold, and sometimes it's lighter. You get a different grittiness to it. It's it's a lot more inconsistent than, than fish meals. Um, so I've never really, I could I couldn't really sort of quantify or qualify what I think has been good about about it. Um, well, you've been, you've been using you've been using. Um... You've been using the bait with a lot of tiger nut meal, and well, tiger. What do you use, Steve? Do you use just the flour, or do you use the meal as well? Um, it's, I think it's the flour, but it, yeah, but, the, fla- but, the, the, fla- but the meal, the meal wouldn't upset me. Yeah, I use both in my nut baits because I like the I like the chunks, so I use I use a fifty fifty mixture of tiger nut flour, nice and fine, and then the meal, just so you get the chunks in there as well. Um, but you were catching, weren't you, on that uh, towards yeah, the end did, of the, yeah, end of the really, season, like on acting? Well, both. I, I basically made it for um, for Grendel. What I wanted to do was see how a white bait performed rather than the golden balls. Because I had, um, I just wanted to see from the catch results whether, whether there was a difference. And also because, because I didn't start till the end of October, on Granville, obviously the water temp's dropping. Mm. So I was thinking more along the lines of, of a lower protein bait um, than the golden balls. Because the golden balls isn't mega high in protein, but with it being 10% Orogel, 20% uh, super gold, it's got it's got a shitload of CPSP90 and Brocacel in it. So it's, it's a reasonable food bait. So, so the theory was... What would happen if I use something what's what's slightly more whiter in colour and has a lower intact protein content and a higher yeah. carb and a higher carbohydrate content? Yeah, which is tiger meal because there's next to no protein in it, is there? Yeah, well, exactly. It's, it's about six percent protein, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's rock all, but, but the other thing was I was looking at, I was thinking about not. Basically, I hot so- with Grenville's golden balls. I put my hot soak on it. Well, I wasn't. I was. I was looking at doing doing the. Um, I just call it my Grenville's white mix by not not putting the hot soak on, but also not putting the Orogel in because the the, the Orogel only goes in at such high levels, so it can facilitate a hot soak. So, so the, the the cunning plan was, if it works, then I want to produce. A mass, a mass baiting approach in very small food items. So, so I wanted to make something like a fourteen by ten barrel, or a fourteen by eight barrel, or something like that, mm. and not have to hot soak it. So I could, I could potentially sweat yeah, so it up. increase the surface area for the leakage. No, no, not at all. Just increase the number of food items. Oh, right, okay. So, 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 so like my, grand, my golden balls, I normally roll them as as as, as 14, 14 mil sausage on an eighteen mil table. So you're getting fourteen by eighteen barrels. Barrels, yeah. No, no. With, with with this white bait, I was I was thinking of going smaller, where you've got something like rolling it on a fourteen mil table with like an eight or ten mil sausage. So, so you're getting instead of getting for the sake of argument, 300 baits per kilo, you're getting six to 800 baits per kilo. Yeah. Um, but when, when they're that small, I think the hot soap would blow blow them apart in terms of the structural integrity, which is why I use the 10% Orogel. I didn't want to use the Orogel because it's 80% protein and I'm trying to make, the whole point of the bait is to make it a, a carbohydrate fermentable bait. With, with with the only the only intact sorry there's no intact 
proteins, the only proteins in there would be hydrolyzed. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, you're, so just going, you're just going all out on the attraction risk, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. But also, I wanted, I wanted it to wash out white. So, so when it's in the water, it's white. Um, and also, like my golden balls mix, I only turn, I only turn um, the, the stuff what I put in the bags. I don't turn the feed bait. I can, it, and the bags work really well when they turn. But it also works really well when, when it's hot soaked. But the, the game plan was to just try it out as, as the, um, the freebies turned as well. So if I'm, spot, if I'm spotting freebies out, then to have a, a you know a, a lower protein source, but turned with the side, you know, I was just thinking it because the game plan for, for Grenville is I want a forty pound common out of there. Yeah, because they're coming, they're coming through now, aren't they? Yeah, there's about there's about seven forty different forty pound commons in there now. Um, so I was just wondering if if it, it would increase my chances of that. The only reason I say that is because I had, I had the last day of the season on Acton, I had one of my target fish, the drop tail common, and I've been after that fish for a long time, and I've not caught it on my normal. Whatever I've done, like I started off on on the liver fish meal, didn't have it on that. Then I went on to the golden balls, I didn't have it on that. And then this spring, I've been using the the, the white mix in cubes, and I and I've had a really good spring. I I went four times in the spring, and I had five originals out. Mm. Um, how so, much so, tiger? How much tiger up flour have you got on that bait, Steve? Twenty percent. Oh, so you've loaded up then, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the. Oh. I, I, it's like it's like the thing where I said to you like when we we're joking around on the WhatsApp uh, with, with tiger nuts as well being thermogenic. I, I'm almost I'm almost up convinced. Any, I'm pretty much convinced that anything that's thermogenic works well in cold water. Absolutely. You know, and like we've spoke about it before, it's minuscule shifts in the carp's metabolism, but. You just don't know what that's doing with regards to their brain chemistry and all the rest of it because anything that's thermogenic seems to work well in cold water. Mm. Well, the, 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 one, the thing what did it for me was um, I read um, something about tiger nut flour in humans. They're saying that the, the, the prebiotic fiber in tiger nuts yeah. promotes, promotes butrate production in, in, in humans in the cold water. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so my thought was, well, if it's producing butrate in your gut, the whole attractiveness of tiger nuts, or a large part of it, I think, is, is butrate production from the lake's yeah. bacteria. The, yeah. the lake's bacteria are all fermenting it. Do you mean, I was going to say, do you mean if you let them ferment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. That, that told... Um, that's the reason for putting it in the cold water bait. And then that's the reason why I've swapped it into the golden balls bait to see if I can improve the fermentation for my bags. Because my bags have done really, really well on Grenville. Mm. Um, and as, as far as as far as all my bigger fish have come off bags. So, so, yeah. Some over bait, some not, but, but it seems to be a really potent um, wait, wait, of just uh, not necessarily isolating them because there's so many fish there, you, you can't isolate them. But it, but it, it certainly seems to have a track record and it doesn't put off the bigger fish. And it seems I don't know, there's something there in, in those bags that what do you put? Well. What do you put in the bag, Steve? Crush boily. Well, it's the only thing you can use, it's boily only. So, yeah, I know, but like, you, I, I mean, golden, you know, the golden balls. It's my golden balls mix, and it's just they're just highly turned. They'll have been in and out of the freezer probably between three and seven times. Do you put whole boilies in the bag though as well? Yeah, yeah, whole boilies. Oh, you mean you mean the, the PVA bag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, what I do is I um, I hit them with a crusher. Um, so then you've got I do two 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 turns. Like some of it's like sort of half boilies and yeah, little chunks. Yeah, a little, you know, little chunks as big as half boilers, and then there's crumb in there. Um, 
but it's how turned those boilies are. They're really well turned. They're sticky. And it, yeah. well, when I when I get a certain consistency, I think right, they are fucking bang up. Um, and and they seem they seem to do well. But what I was saying about the drop tail is I had that literally on the last day of the season. I had my damn rod. The, the rod I had on the dam um, was doing absolutely nothing. And at three in the morning, I had a stocky on my left hander, and it took me right hand rod out. So, so come first light, well, six o'clock in the morning, but I'm not pissing about three rod tricking it on the dam. And I'd seen fish to the left of my left hand spot. So I literally put, I put a hook bait on, cast it out, just got a decent drop pot, sweet, and I put two spots of the fermented maize over it and both landed with a decent crosswind. It was like we had a big storm at the end of the season, it was the 12th of April. Um, and I got I landed two spots right on the money, so I, I thought, right, that'll do. And, and four hours later, it, it ripped off with the drop tail. Mm. And that that was just there was just the hook bait and two two midi spawns of fermented maize. So so what I was thinking about lactic acid in particular be, seeming to be attractive to commons. Um, was was that a factor given that the maize is lacto fermented? And I've been after that that fish, and it's the only rod that didn't have any barley on it. Yeah, the old commons are mysterious creatures, aren't they? Mm. Just... But I'm trying to mysteriously find one in Grenville in 72 acres. The seven, the seven in 72 acres, and I would give my left nut for one of them. <laughs> I think they, um, I think they're getting close to 50 as well, aren't they? Um, the last, the biggest one I've, I've I've heard of was about 42 and a half, 43. Oh, is that all they are? Oh, I assume. Yeah, they, 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 they went in a lot later than the others. Yeah, but they've still gr- uh, they've still grown well, haven't they? They've grown. Oh well. yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. But, I mean, there's there's probably four to five times more 50 pound mirrors than there are 40 pound commons. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're five times more likely to get a 50 pound mirror than you are a 40 pound common. Yeah. It's all a numbers game on on Grenville, isn't it? A lot, a yeah, lot. you you just you just fishing for bites. You, you yeah. can't target anything. You just you just fishing for bites. But I I, I I always try and stack the odds in my favour, doing something or other, um, with a game plan in mind. And it, it, I'm not saying it, it always works, but it's it's just keeps me entertained. <laughs> keep keep keeps keeps me as, as as insane as I am. <laughs> 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 so, talking about your HXB, mate, fucking Woolley had, had the, the big lever out on that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He he, he actually went, you know, um, I mean, he's a character. He is Rob Woolley. He, he joined acting, and he was in Thailand on holiday partying, because he's a bit of a party animal, he is. And he, he rang me from, from Thailand, and uh, he says, can you sort me some bait out? I says, why? He says, I'm getting, I'm getting Acton Bernal next week. I said, oh, you've joined that, have you? He says, yeah. He says, I'm in Thailand in a minute. It's on holiday. So I says, all right. Says, it's all right for some. So he, he, he says, I'll nip in your house on the, on the way through back from the airport. Sort me some bait out. So I sorted him a bit of bait out, and it was super orange. He didn't even pay me for it, which I wasn't very happy about. <laughs> and <laughs> he, he went on acting, and I think he had... I think he had two bites on it and lost both of them. But then the following week, because he'd used the HXB a lot more, he had me rolling some of that in white. And, and yeah, when you were there, weren't you? And, he, and mm. I think I think you said that you said to him where you'd seen some fish or whatever, and he went in there and he caught that leather. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was on the lower of a social with, with my mate Lee, uh, and, he, and he come wandering around and uh, he said he was going to the top line. I said, get in steps, mate. The fish are in steps. And uh, yeah, he went in. As I said, you only eat a fish about 40 yards, something like that. And he went in and he had the big lever. <laughs> one of my targets. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> one of your targets, yeah. I think, I think it was just under 40, wasn't it? It was 39 something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mega fish, though. It doesn't come out much as well. Yeah, I know. He had a right result there, yeah. Uh, yeah happy days. Is that, still, so, is that still going, that fish? Uh, no, it died in the. Uh, 
when we had the, that first heat wave in July, but when it went to 41 degrees C, it last, went belly up. Last, last year? Yeah, 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 last oh, summer. That's, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. It's an absolute wounder, mate. Um, fortunately, I, I caught it um, at the end of the season. So what we have now, uh, last summer was uh, two... Yeah, so, so I basically had it in start of April 20, 2022, and then I had it at 38.6, um, and then I had it the opening trip of the 2020, you know, June 2022, I had it opening trip at 41.6, yeah. um, and then a month later it died in the heat wave. Proper leather as well, wasn't it? A proper yeah, leather. yeah, true, true proper leather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rare when I had it, yeah, when I had it at 38.6, I was overjoyed. But I was just gutted it wasn't forty pound. Mm. I, I know, I know, I know. We all say, we all yeah, say. it's only a number, like, but yeah, it's a, well, no, no, I, I just wanted a forty pound true leather. Mm. Same, same thing as I want. I want a forty pound common. Yeah. Like two, two, two years ago, um, on Grenville, I had I had one of the commons at thirty four ten, which is I think it was about two and a half years ago. It would have been September nineteen. So, so that common now will be over forty pound. That's four. That's four years ago, Steve. Jesus. Well, yeah, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. Jesus, yeah. So this September that will be four years ago. So that 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 fish will definitely be over forty pound now. Yeah. Um, but but I, I, I I'm just gagging for a forty pound common. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I just, when a drop tail, it was down in weight. Potentially, the drop tail could do forty pound. It's done forty pound twice, I think. And it's not. And if it's not forty pound, it's normally about thirty nine when it, when I had it. But it was like thirty seven six. So it was a couple of pound down on on what um what it could have been. Um, but yeah, I just, I just, I just I, I'm just gagging for a forty pound comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I've chased a forty pound common a couple of times. I've caught one. I, I, I didn't. Ca- I haven't caught a forty. I've had. I've had one that's been forty, but it wasn't forty when I caught it. Mm. But yeah, commons are always like dead rare years ago, weren't they? But there's a lot more of them now. I think it depends where you fish. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but I mean, years ago, I mean, even twenty pound commons, like they were like a big thing. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, fishing's changed a lot since in the last yeah. twenty years or whatever. And uh, there's just a lot more big fish, but yeah, still it's forty pound commons. They're still uh, they're nowhere near as numerous as as mirrors, are they? No, not at all. Unless you either fish primly, yeah, down uh, there, yeah, or farriers, farriers, farriers are bundies. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. those are the places with a lot of big commons. Yeah. Um, otherwise, no, I mean, no, you you know. I mean, I, th- I think in Grenville, I'm not sure whether there's either 50 or 100 of the original batch he put in. Um, so, of 80, you know, 1,800 fish, give or take, you might be looking at 50 or 100 of the original commons mm. what went in. So, so you know, you, you're looking at what at best between 1 in 18 and 1 in 36 fish is a common. Yeah. You know, and, and and only seven of those fifty or seven of those a hundred are like forty plus. So you're up against it. Whereas potentially there might be fifty. Uh, so there might be thirty fifties in there now. Yeah, it's maddening. There could be place. potentially five sixties. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just insane. Um, yeah. Well, my bit's caught one of them sexy, Steve. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. Oh. I, and that's the only fish Matt has had this season, isn't it? Um, I think it might be, mate. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit. It's a, it's actually insane, really, because that was his first bite out of there on that Frankie Mix bait. It was, that was the yeah. first bite that he'd had. Usually, he's caught, he's caught a few fish out of there using my bait. I think he's caught on the Super Orange, the HXB, the Red Devil. I mean, he doesn't fish an awful lot. Yeah. Um, and I think he's the only person who's ever used that Frankie Mix on there. And I think he'd only put about in pre. I think it was his eighth night using that bait on there, so he's probably put ten kilo in, but not a lot for two thousand fish. So nothing, is it? He's he's dropped. He's dropped lucky, like which is what you've got to do on a big water like that with yeah. a lot of fishing. You've just got to drop in the right swim where that fish are the big ones. 
he's dropped lucky and and bang like he's had the fish of his dreams. Yeah, I was. I mean, I think I was happier than him when he caught that. <laughs> so what's the, what is that Frankie mix? Is it a fish meal? Yeah, but it's yeah, it's a it's a fish meal, but it's yeah, it's quite a bit different than a lot of other fish meals. I mean, it's very very soluble. Um, and it's got a few unusual bits and bobs in it as well. Yeah, it's got herbs in it and stuff. And yeah, it's caught well. It's caught. It's caught the. I mean, I've only been selling that bit. I mean, I came up with it at the end of twenty twenty. Um, been testing it for about ten months and then started selling it. So it's caught the biggest fish in about five or six different lakes. I mean, because that's the biggest one in Granville. Isn't it? it wasn't at its biggest yeah, weight. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the late record, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was well down, well down compared to what it has done. But yeah, um, it's done sixty five, hasn't it? But a yeah, big it fish done sixty five twelve twice. Yeah, a big fish like that though. Uh, I was on about this to Matt. Big fish like that, the, the amount, the amount they can go up and down depending on how much bait they get caught over, it'll be unbelievable. It's how much they spawn as well. On, yeah, on yeah, there. spawning as well. Yeah, yeah. But on, it had been on. caught though. It had been caught at sixty three only a few weeks before or a month before. Yeah. Jason can caught it, didn't he? Yeah, Jason had it. Then, I, then I'm not sure. I think Albie had it. Albie had it after him, and then Matt had it after him. He doesn't normally do that many catches, so it's probably a bit stressed. Yeah, yeah, you would say that because it's been caught on my bit, wouldn't you? No, 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 no. I don't mean that. <laughs> no, it's it's pro it's probably it's just hungry as well, mate. It's stress, well, yeah, because it's September, so it starts building up. But what I'm yeah. saying is, J Jason can had it. And then a few weeks later, Albie had it, and then it, and then it got caught again off Matt. So, so, so normally when they get caught a few times in a row, they usually go down in weight just because of the stress. Well, of, they're not the all, stress they're of not, the catchers. They're not all the same, mate. I, I know some yeah. fish that get caught, you know, loads of times, and they're up in weight. There was there was one in Trentham. It was insane. It used to fluctuate that much. It was uh, mm. used to go up and down and weight a lot. It used to get caught quite a bit, but. They can go up and down a lot naturally, mate. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, a big fish like that, it, it could quite conceivably put three or four pound of, of weight on him just in food when it goes on a gorge. Oh yeah, easy, easy. And the amount of bait one goes in Granville. Yeah. You know, like some like some people are doing twenty kilo bait drops, thirty kilo bait drops. Oh yeah, they're fishing over massive beds of bait, aren't they? Yeah. So so if, so if a fish moves in on that, like you say, it could have a sixty pound fish could have. Three or four kilo of boiling in its guts. Yeah, no problem. Well, that's, that's eight pound, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I mean. <laughs> I, hell of a lot of weight. I mean, yeah. I, I've caught twenties. I've caught twenties like three or four days apart, and like they're over a pound. Low twenties, they're over a pound in difference on the same scales, and it just depends on how much they vet. Yeah, definitely. But I, I've noticed certainly with some of the bigger acting fish, if they slip up a couple of times on the bounce, they normally drop a bit, mm. and, I, and I think it's. Especially if the fish water don't get caught loads, I think I think they get a bit stressed. Like like for instance, say they go sulking, they go off bait for a couple of weeks, and then the first time they go back on bait, they get nailed again. Mm. I, th I think potentially you, they can lose weight through a stress response just because they're not. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, obviously, like the Grenville fish. I mean, it's rich in naturals, but they're that big because of the, the food. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the the they aren't growing. Are they growing just on natural? I mean, the fish would get very big in Granville anyway without any bait. Yeah, because the water quality is off yeah. the scale. But they they're probably all at least ten pound bigger than what they'd be naturally, aren't they? Oh, easy. Yeah, easy. Easy. You know. But the other thing is, still there, Sam. You're going to sleep over here, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> he, can't, he can't get a word in edgeway. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the, another thing about Grenville, what what is sort of special is the amount of fish meal going in. I think it drives the benthic organisms. In oh, definitely. Yeah, you, you're you're fertilising the environment, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Because 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 the fish are shitting it out, shitting a lot of fish meal out. Yeah. And and it's going it's going into the sill and it's driving the benthic chain. Yeah. Um, I mean, the blood worm matches on there are just biblical. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was there. I was right on the end of a northeaster. Um, it was a cold wind, and, and the fish was so far away. I was fishing a, a swim that only me and Kirky fish. Basically, I, I fish it 
when I can't make my mind up, and occasionally Kirky goes on there in the spring and fishes close in, but because he because he's hardly there, there's never anybody in that swim. But it was right on the end of a new northeasterly, and I thought there's a chance. But all I could see, I couldn't. The fish were so far away, I couldn't even see the fish. All I could see were the splashes because it was about a 25 mile an hour gust. When they were coming up, taking the hatch, you could just see the splashes from a distance because I'm probably six, seven hundred yards away from the fish, and yeah. you could just see these massive splashes, and then there's a plume of spray coming back. Um, and that's just the hatches. The chronomids were just behind the bushes behind me, Bivy. It was just black with buzzers. Is the big is the big silk gullies on Granville then as well? Um, no, not not really. The sort of deep bits where the hatches come come from, it's just like a big bowl. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I, I was I was having a, a little well, not so much a debate like that. Somebody was on about fly hatches and that, uh, and bloodworm, and bloodworm. You think like most people think that they just live in silts, but they don't actually because I. I fish waters where the bottom's quite hard, and you've still got bloodworm there where the bottom's quite hard. Yeah, I mean, even on waters where you think the bottom is hard, there is still some degree of silt. Generally. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. generally speaking. So, yeah. um, but but where the, where the way you see when the fish are out in the middle, like say, if, basically Grenville's like a. If you look at a map of Africa, it's roughly that shape, and then if, if you went to the top of Africa, if you look at the map of Africa, if you, if you look where sort of Mali is and, and, and that sort of area, there's a really deep bowl up there on Grenville and, and it goes down to about 36 foot. But the average depth is like between 26 and 30 foot. And it's not, you know, there's a, there's a depth variation of say four foot between 26 foot and 30 foot maybe on a lot of the areas. And that's that's where the, the big hatch is seem to come from yeah. um, and, and that's when the fish when, when, when they're 300 yards out and no one can catch them and they just bounce and you're seeing like hundreds of, of just enormous fish my eyesight is absolutely garbage so if I see a fish at 400 yards and I think Jesus that was a donkey it's a donkey yeah. do you know what I mean it's just, yeah. just but, but the, the feeding the mad- you know it's a mad place that Granville. I mean, because of the, because of the massive areas where you just can't reach the fish. That's what makes it so difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it's rock hard. I mean, when you get on fish, they're actually very easy to catch. They're which not the normal, which they normally are on a big water, aren't they? Yeah, but the, the part is that they don't they don't come out. The amount of fish I've had, I have not had many fish off there, but I've had quite a few. And, and Paul say, like when I when I had a, a thirty four eight um, full, proper fully scaled really dark brown. I sent the picture to Sam. Um, and it was 34.8 and Paul said, well, I've no record of that since it's been stocked. It's never been out at 30 plus. Mm. Um, so, so given that it's a, given that it's a fully, it, it probably hasn't been out in well over two years, possibly a lot longer because he doesn't know because he only records. Yeah. Like the original mass- stocking, got- he only records them over 30 pounds. They've got all that free food and they've got all that massive area where no one can reach them. They, they, they can just sit out there for as long as they want, can't they? Yeah, but they're not, I, don't, I don't think they're avoiding angling pressure. I just think they're out there because of the bloodworm and the hatches. <clears throat> yeah, possibly. I'd probably say a bit of both myself, like, but yeah. I, but I just don't think they're pressured fish. They don't count as pressured fish to me. Because, because, because by and large... On average, they're not getting caught once a year. Obviously, some fish, like when Matt had that, it was his third capture of the season. But if you look on average, then some fish aren't getting caught for seven years. Well, a fish what hasn't been out for seven years is not a pressured fish because it hasn't been hooked. Yeah, but I, I don't look at it like that, to be honest with you. Really. Uh, the way I look at it is how much angling press of the game. Rods going in, spotting, all the rest of it, so... Because that's what pushes fish out into no man's land, really, a lot of the time. What's yeah, it? but only pressured fish, and these fish are not pressured. But yeah. by what what I def what I define pressured as. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you're just taking it on captures, aren't you? Yeah, but also depth of water. There's a big difference between spotting in 30 foot and spotting in 3 foot. Yeah, there if, is. If, if, if you're putting a spot over a fish in 30 foot of water, how effective it, is it? But it don't, well, you've got, lads getting in the, you've got lads getting in the water as well, haven't you? Yeah, but again, a lead going in in 26 foot of water or a lead going in in 3 foot of water, there's a big difference. Yeah, there's a big difference, yeah. Because yeah, where the splat went for a start, you've got in 26 foot of water, it's landing three meters behind where it's landing with a swing back. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there's just a massive difference. Between, like, like an Acton, when, you, when you're at the top end of Acton and in the summer you've got three foot. If you put a lead on a fish, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? The, the fish is, it. Yeah, it's probably Yeah, probably well, you will spook it, but the other thing yeah. is, like a 40 pound fish in three foot of water, it's only got a foot clearance at the bottom and, and or less, and it's got the same or less to the surface. Mm. If, you, if you've got 18 inches to, to nearly two foot of depth of the fish, its back's not far from, from the surface, and its belly's not far from the silt. So if you're putting a three, four ounce lead right on it, it's got to be much more um disturbing. Yeah, it's, it's going to disturb it more, but I'd still I say, small, I would still say... Lake. I would still say, personally, like that, even on Grenville, if you rocked up and there's a big shoal of fish in front of you and you did 100 casts, you'd probably catch less than if you did three. Oh, yeah, given. Yeah. Are you still there, Sambo? I'm here, mate. How many stars yeah. have you had? Fucking loads. Just sitting back <laughs> listening, aren't I? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm on the I, fucking I, gin now. I just keep chatting. I anyway. as long as it's fishing related, I just keep just keep Dude. chatting. Here's one, Dino. Go on, talk us through branch chain amino acids. What do you want to know? Why? Why do you think they work? Well, it, it it's just basics, really. The the the, the initial um, ideas that I've got with it is basically because. Obviously, it's um, muscle mass. It can't be can't be can't be made without branch chain amino acids. Mm. And obviously, bigger fish have obviously got more muscle mass. So it's just it just sort of went down that route. I noticed with the milk proteins, it was definitely catching bigger than average fish, and and that's where I've gone along that line. So you know, it's sort of my thinking's developed now along the lines of things that are rich in branch chain amino acids definitely seem to increase the chances of catching big fish. I'm not saying it's the only thing they'll catch them because you'll catch them on all sorts of baits, but um, I definitely think it's a factor. And as I say, I had a little look at um, liver powder um, and that was quite high in the branch chain amino acids. So, so yeah, that what about meat good. meals? Because because meat's got quite the, a lot of leucine in it. Hasn't the, it? There's there's nothing, there's no ingredients that even come close to the milk proteins. Whey protein is obviously the best one, um, but casein's good. Uh, and, and and I mean I've got I've got a few crazy theories about uh, receptors being upregulated in older fish and, and things like this. Um, and it makes sense to me whether or not I'll ever prove it is a different story, but I definitely think um, high levels of whey protein concentrate and in, in your baits. Uh, I mean, LT fish meals are fairly high in um, branch chain amino acids, but they're nowhere near as concentrated as the, the milk proteins. Have you, have you looked into hydrolyzed collagen? No. Is that I in it? I'm presuming so. I, I just, well, I've never used it, but, but I've, I've looked, I've looked at, I've never looked at the profile to be fair, but I was just wondering if, if hydrolyzed collagen would be um, stimulatory. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the main amino acids in collagen are proline, glycine, 
I think those are the main ones, particularly glycine, I think. Yeah, well, the, the, the proline's an interesting one because that's iron, the milk's as well. That's iron, yeah. casein. Well, particularly casein. Uh, that's not, that's not a branch chain amino acid, though. No, no, no. But proline is an extremely interesting amino acid for a number of reasons. Um, one, um, proline actually, if a foodstuff's high in proline, then it actually increases the feed intake in carp. That's like proven, and they utilize that in the fish feed industry as well. Um, I have, I do know that there was one bait maker who used to add um, the neat amino acid proline into his bait, and I would assume it would have been for that reason to increase feed intake. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. But proline is interesting. It's really interesting because there's there's the structural analogs of it. Um, that are present in a few other things that I'm very interested in. Um, obviously, it's critical in the um, opioid peptides as well. It's yeah, it's very interesting. Proline is yeah, very interesting. There, there's a proline variant as well, isn't there? Hydroxyproline. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, well, that's in, that's what's in collagen is hydroxyproline. Co collagen is basically fourteen percent hydroxyproline. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's... well, that 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 might be something that would be good for sticking in your bait to increase the feed intake. Yeah, well, well, probably uh, uh, um, a gustatory stimulant as well. It's one of the yeah, seven. Yeah. It's well, one of the seven from cats, onion, and dove. In. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is as well. Um, you know, most of the well, all the amino acids have some have some reaction in carp anyway, but um, proline. Is definitely interesting with regards to the taste receptors as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's one of the it's one of the seven what was identified in, in the cat's onion and dolphin paper, two thousand three. Yeah, well, my favourite spice contains a molecule. I spoke about it before. That is an actual structural analog of proline, and it's water soluble. Trichinelle. Yeah, it's war. It's water soluble. And it ticks all the boxes. And, and and another thing, like this is all going into the territory of crazy theories that I'll probably never prove, or I'll try to, but um I'm convinced there's something going on with proline receptors as carp get as as carp age. As the older carp get, I am sure that there's more proline receptors present in the in the gustatory system. Or there's something going on with this because well, JB said the receptor dense. He's got a paper when he did the podcast with Sam. He said, yeah, it increases when the, with age. Yeah. yeah. Basically, the receptor density increases because I thought, like you said, that it was an upregulation of sensitivity. Yeah, or an upregulation of gene expression. That's what I meant, which, is, which ties in with what John Baker says. So, obviously, as they get older, say we're talking about proline, then all of a sudden... The expression of that gene goes up, goes up. So then they've got more receptors for for the proline. And the, I mean, there's something going on because I mean, I might as well give the game away. I'm not really bothered. Um, fenugreek is an unbelievable additive, and, and, and it mm. definitely, it definitely is something that if you analyze the results, it, it's definitely got a propensity to catch big fish. I mean, fenugreek yeah. is absolutely superb. I agree with that. That's why ma the f uh, maple flavor is so effective. Yeah, yeah, opinion. maple flavor. Yeah, 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 yeah. J just to sort of switch switch back a little bit, um, you're talking about bigger fish being attracted to BCAAs. What about older fish as well? But the reason why I say yeah, that older is, ones as well. Yeah, I should have yeah, said that. As branch well, chain. Time. Yeah, branch chain amino acids really, really important for retaining muscle. So obviously, there's something yeah, called sarcopenia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is basically age-related atrophy of the muscle. That's in humans I'm, I'm talking about now. And would yeah. that be leucine, Sam? Yeah, isoleucine, isoleucine leucine, leucine, and valine. Valine, leucine. Yeah. yeah, exactly. With the, those are the branched-chain amino acids. So certainly Yeah, no, but what I'm saying is in humans, leucine, is, leucine um, brings on mTOR, doesn't it? Initiates mTOR. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What I was going to say is for humans, as we age, obviously we our muscles we lose them year on year. It's called sarcopenia, which is age-related yeah. muscle atrophy. I mean, obviously we're translating it to carp, but maybe that's the same. You know, maybe carp have a harder time retaining muscle. So who knows if they're eating something that's high in branched chain amino acids, um, 
you know, perhaps that's something that they're going to seek out because they're in a tune with their body and they can tell that it's obviously going to retain the muscle, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it does open up the argument of do they know what's good for them or not? I think they probably do. Um, but I think that's another reason why branch chain amino acids are probably really fucking, even if they know it or not, just from like an ethics standpoint, I think it makes good sense to use ingredients that are high in branch chain amino acids just to yeah. help the cart retain the muscle, which obviously is really, really important for all animals and, and humans alike. Yeah, but valine was, was one of the um, amino acids that was, I'm pretty sure that it didn't do a lot until it was put into a mix. And, and I think the from Katsunya and I, I'm pretty sure, I and mean, we're going back from memory, I've not read it for, for a long time, but, but valine did do a lot on its own. But when it was combined with two other aminos, then then it, it was um, it initiated. Uh, it was olfactory, not gustatory. Yeah. It was olfactory um, and initiated um, food searching behaviour. There's, um, there's a few like that, but but the thing is, I mean that that's talking from a olfactory perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, whereas I think the argument, or certainly my argument, not argument, but my idea, and I think other yeah. people's as well, is, you know, it, when they ingest that, they can perhaps tell that that is yeah. doing them some good. Well, the thing is as well, to be honest with you, how I look at it, nobody's studying old car. No, All no. these tank tests, they're all done on little young, young babies. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really it doesn't point. really, for me... It holds no validity for a fishing situation that yeah. I'm interested in. That's you precisely, said, that's... What I said. That's precisely what I said. Yeah, I, I, I don't think tank tests, while while useful, oh, I don't write them off completely. No, no. While, while useful, I just don't think it translates to big old fish. Definitely not. Definitely just, not. Just, just from my fishing experience, um. Because I, in the homemade bait boss group, people have always said that low levels of citric have been um, re repellent. When when they when they put something like I don't know, it was one gram per egg or something in, in a hook bait, then they've done a tank test and the, and the fish haven't have been repelled by it. Whereas when I put it on my freebies, then I'm catching. Yeah, but you as well. I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong because I do actually agree with you. But you've got the the different situation in the lake with the water volumes greater, the movement, and all the rest. No, absolutely, the, the dilution effect. I mean, it's only, yeah, yeah. It's only going yeah. it's only going in one direction. But the point is, one gram per egg in a bound pop up isn't a massive concentration because it's no, not that, it's that's... not leaching out, is it? A, that, that's way that's way lower than what what I put in, and someone makes their eye sell, and it and mm. they catch loads of fish. That's way lower. Yeah. So exactly that's what I'm saying. So 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 your your experience is at higher levels you catch fish, whereas when people have tank tested hook baits at a lower level, it's repellent. Well, I think so. So, 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 so that tells me <coughs> that juvenile carp have a much lower threshold for citric. The, the bigger carp. Yeah. The, I mean, I know I know that um, my old mate from Specialised Duke Bates, um, <laughs> um, I think he used to coat some of his Duke Bates. I don't think he sells them anymore. I think he used to coat them in neat citric acid, which is a little bit insane, but who knows? Yeah, I've never tried that, so... I don't... The only the only experiment I've ever done with neat citric acid is um, in bags. I did a little crazy experiment once on on a runs water it made and all. Um, well, it was like a follow on thing. I'd I'd already done one experiment, and it was after something what Jason Ryder said. Um, he said that if you flood the water with um, too many organic acids, it draws all the fish in. And they start showing and all the rest of it, but it just confuses them and they don't pick your root bait up properly. Mm. Um, and I tried it. I think the first place I did it, it was the very first time I ever fished. Uh, no, it was the second time because I only fished it three times. Lynch Hill, Christchurch. And I got this particle and I put um, 
Well, a few organic acids and and into the particle mix. It, it way higher levels than what I would have done if I was doing it like in it calculatedly. And um, I had loads of fish showing on me for twenty four hours, and I couldn't get a bite at all. And they and they were there. And then I followed it on. I went this. I went to this runs water, and um, mm. I thought I'll put bags of neat citric and uh, MSG on the rigs and all I kept getting was like aborted takes I must have had about 10 aborted takes in about 4 or 5 hours so I just thought to myself everything that Jason Ryder said was all right about it but then I heard about this coating oop baits and citric acid thing and then I, I just thought well mm, it'd be interesting to actually know if he actually did that um, but it depends on the time Depends on the time that the fish fish come into the exactly the exactly. Yeah. If, you, if, you caught, yeah. if you caught it on a hook bait and, it, and there isn't any in, in the actual inner yeah. boiling matrix, because it'll, cause it'll how, how much anyway. how much is washing off? Yeah, well, it dissolves anyway. Citric does, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But but what I'm saying is, even say you cast out and you get a bite three hours later, it can all be gone. Concentration on the outside of that pop up. Well, it could all be don't... gone. Could all be. Could all. Be, I mean, it does could, could, could all be gone exactly. It does dissolve. Um, Cetric does the same as MSG dissipates. Yeah. You know, and that's why I, when I when I do my hot soak, I do it at a specific concentration. Yeah. Working out that there's probably a six to eight hour minimum time lag between it going in the drink and getting the bite. Yeah, yeah. That said, that said, the first time I had a fish called a peach. I had it on that bait at full a full concentration of, of my uh, my soak, and I had it within forty five minutes of spotting out. Yeah, and I I was surprised at that. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think there's obviously some dilution, but not a, a you know not as much as there is at the six to eight hour mark. Yeah. Um. So that did surprise me. Um. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think if you if you if you put something in. The, the other thing I've noticed is when, when you're using citric in a higher concentration, you catch fewer stockings. Because the year before, when I was using my, my full-strength soak, I only had nine stockies all season on Acton. I had 15 originals and nine stockies. And this season, to try and catch the ones that I can't catch, I've halved, I've halved the concentration of the citric. And this season, I've had 25 stockies instead of nine. I've, I've had 15 originals. And 25 stockies. Now, that said, the stockies are obviously grow. you know, a year later, the stockies are probably four or five pounds heavier, but I've, ca I've definitely caught more stockies yeah. with the lower concentration of citric. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I rate citric acid massively. I, know, I don't think Sam does. I don't think he's much for it. No, I, just, no, I mean, it's... <laughs> I think it's uh, it's valid. It can catch fish, etc. But I think there's better stuff out there for sure. Mm. Yeah, I really do. I, I think as well. It, I mean, we were talking. Well, I think Dean was talking about the MPT earlier being really hit and miss. That is exactly what I've found as well. I, I think it can work well. It can not work well. I think realistically, the window where there is enough DMPT dispersion to be, you know, to really switch the carp on. Balancing that up to, you know, not being too much to switch them off, not, you know, not being too little so they can't actually detect it. I think it's a very fine window and it just makes yeah, it unusable. I mean, That's I DMPT. Think I think it's a kind of similar thing with citric acid. No, nah, I don't think it is. I do. I think if it's in the bait that they're eating, I think it's an extremely potent gustatory stimulant. I mean, the, the results that I've had, the difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just have not seen that what's i mean i know look most people would disagree with me i'm sure um and obviously you go on all the forums and everything and everyone raves about it but watching watching carp in the lake in my pond in my tank it and you know that, that's a whole multitude of different ages of carp um some of them very old i'm just not i'm just not seeing that you know it's and i don't i'm not poo-pooing anyone else's findings you know it, it, we all have our own experiences it's just i for love nor money i can't i can't like see the same thing that's not to say i haven't caught fish with citric acid in baits or I, and I haven't got fish feeding with citric acid i've done all that i just don't think it is necessarily 
a standout ingredient, not to the degree that most people think it is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, when I've been using the white bait, I haven't been putting my hot soak on it, and I've done really well on that bait, as well as I've done on, on my golden balls without the citric. Well, there we go. Thing is, though, Sam. But 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 it's a different bait. Well, there we go. The thing <laughs> is, Sam, as well. Mm. Remember when we were chatting about essential oils? Mm, well, we we mate, we've spoken about essential oils yeah, many yeah, times well, on, on the, the, phone. On the I don't early know. podcasts. Oh, on the podcast, yeah, yeah. yeah well, you, you actually twigged something in my mind that I'd never really considered when we were on yeah. about the citric, the citrus ones. Yeah, uh, and, and you said there's a possibility. Uh, what about citric acid? And 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 citric acid must be in those. Essential oils, those it good is. citric, citrus ones, citrus yeah. fruit ones, like the limes, the yeah. oranges, the tangerines. Uh, and you, and you've said yourself that when you've done the tank tests with them, that it, the results were very good. Yeah, absolutely. But there's there's more to them than just citric acid. Yeah, there is. There is. I mean, I, I hadn't even cons- I hadn't even looked at that because it wasn't something that I was looking for in the attraction stakes at all. It was you really that made me think about that. I'd never even thought about it. But again, it, it's not necessarily the citric acid that's switching them on. That, that, that in it's those going to be cit- a factor if the citric acid present in there. That's going to have a that's going to ha- have a bearing on the reaction to that to that essential oil. If that's true, again, it might come back to a case of synergy. You know, it is do certain ingredients work better when they coincide with other ingredients? I think that's they they. they I think they probably do. I think it would be foolish to to flat out say that's impossible if if you want to go to the other extreme. If yeah. if I might interject here, yeah. I think personally, citric works better when they chew it. So it, yeah, in yeah, terms, in, in, I, I don't put citric on my hook baits, and uh, the reason I don't do it is because they don't chew the hook baits. When when I'm when I'm using citric, I'm trying to achieve a specific concentration, but but for that to work, when did you in it? Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is as well, which you know, so I'm only telling you something that you know, is that even if it's a taste stimulant, the carp doesn't need it in its mouth to taste it. No, no, I know that, I know that, but what my point is. You need a specific molar concentration in order to, to to stimulate a response in the gustatory receptor. Now, if you if you've got if you've got a a pop up, for the sake of argument, you've put one gram in, in a in a one egg mix, and then you've air dried that pop up, and then that pop up goes out in the drink. How close does that carp have to get to that hook bait? in order to detect the citric in that hook bait. Secondly, that hook bait may be in the water for 24 hours. What, yeah, is, the yeah, range, so the what, what, what is the range of concentration within that hook bait over that 24-hour period from when you first cast out to when you wind in? And how is that concentration in, in, in reference to... To, to, to the molar concentration that the carp is going to be stimulated to some degree by. For, for what I've read from citric, it's got a hundredfold concentration gradient where it's where it's reasonably effective. So, so obviously there's a, a large concentration gradient over which it works. But my point is, if you've got a 14 mil pop-up, just for sake of argument, how much citric is, is, is that giving off? Per yeah, I mean, unit, per, per unit it, time, and how, and how close does that carp have to get in order to get a gustatory stimulatory effect? Whereas, if I've spotted, for the sake of argument, 100 baits out with the specific concentration of citric in a liquid form soaked into the outside, when those fish come across that and start chewing it and blowing it out of its gills, that's when I think citric comes into its own. I I don't put it in hook baits. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand where you're coming from, but 
It's so I mean that's just um analogous to the same situation that say for instance you you're making um a hook bait or a special pop up or whatever because people like making them now. Um <laughs> and and you're putting an essential oil or a liquid flavour in and it works on ionization. It's just the same as thinking, well, I don't seem to ever get any bites on, on these pop-ups until it's been in the water for 10 hours, so maybe I should reduce that flavour down to 2 mil instead of 4 mil or whatever because it's too strong at first or vice versa. You, there's just so many variables that you can't answer. Yeah. And, and the the only the only thing I can say about citric acid is the, the same as with lots of uh, taste stimulants. To me, the short range attracts us as well because as soon as the carp comes within so so far of the hoop bait, I'm pretty much convinced that it can taste it and then it can decide whether it wants to take it in its mouth or not. Yeah, I don't disagree. I just think it's more powerful on your freebies. Yeah, well, I put it in both. I put it in both. Yeah. Well, here we go then, boys. What about the... Com- I've mentioned Synergy earlier, right? What about the combination of citric acid and another organic acid? Have either of you gone down that route? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a certain organic acid you think it works better with? Because I, I think there is. Um, When I was on Selby, I used, and I was after the commons, I used to put citric and ascorbic in my particles. And then, then I would use that particle juice on my nut mix, and I and I seem to get a good response on that. Yeah. Um, I haven't used ascorbic since Selby. Um, that said, in my spod mix for Acton, obviously with the with the maize, you've got lactic acid, and then other ingredients like when I put Bella can in 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 the the golden balls. Obviously, there's, there's a few organic acids in the Bella can. Yeah, there's um, loads. There's loads, mate. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 although I'm putting citric externally, there's actually there's, there's actually citric acid in Bella can. Right, wasn't aware of that. Yeah, um, I use Bella can for this what I call the smelly ones. Um, Principally, which I'm presuming is isovaleric, caproic, and, and embutric. Yeah, um, big list pl- of pl- yeah. pl- plus others, but I'm, 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 those are the ones that I'm I'm, I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, but cer- certainly from from the Selby point of view, putting putting ascorbic and and the citric in in the particle juice seem to work uh, very well. Um, but well, then again, you, you know, you, you're both fans of ascorbic, aren't you? So, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. No, I'm not. You're, you're, you're not a fan of ascorbic. All right. I think I think Pete was. Maybe you're confusing me with him. Was it Pete? Well, I've never I've never used it um, as as a, a an additive on its own. Um, you know, neat ascorbic acid, but it's uh, vitamin C. And anything I've always found anything with a high vitamin C content is good in bait. Yeah, well, that's what paprika is, isn't it? Exactly, and it's rubbing red chili. and chili, red. chilies, chilies, that's paprika. Tasty. You know, always very good in bait. What, but, what about but, you then? Uh, scob- Sorry, I say ascorbic acid directly works on the gustatory receptor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, so, so we're gonna have a we're gonna have a pee break, boys. I'll be back in a second. Yeah, go for it. So, so it go on, Sam. Steve, you've used it with um, ascorbic acid. You used it with any others? Um, not knowingly, not not as in purposely, purposely put put in yeah. X, Y, and Z in together. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, like when I was on Selby, I was using um, I was using CSL. The CSL stabilized with with propanoic. So, so, so unwittingly, I'm also using propanoic in the in the mix. Yeah. So, again, you, you know, and also CSL has lactic a lot of lactic acid in. So, 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 so unwittingly, I'm using propanoic, lactic, ascorbic, and citric together. Psst. 
If you're still here and you happen to be listening on the Apple Podcast app or Apple iTunes, please take a few moments, leave me a review, let me know how we're doing with this podcast. A, it's really nice to hear from you, and B, it helps this podcast stay relevant and stay in the ratings. If it doesn't stay in the ratings, it falls behind, um, people don't listen to it, and obviously that means there's not much point me doing it anymore. So if you can take a moment to leave me a review, I'd really appreciate it. If you're not listening on an Apple device, I don't think you can leave us a review, unless there's some means that I'm not aware of, um, but Nonetheless, I appreciate you listening. It does mean a lot to me. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out on social media. That's it. I look forward to bringing the next episode to you very soon.